Okay, so this is part two of our series on the guiding principles of scientific inquiry. Um, so in the last video, I kind of laid out the introduction, but this one we're going to get into the first uh, principle and talk about it in a little bit of depth as to what that principle is and what it is not and why we have it. Um, and so let's get started here with the first principle of scientific inquiry. One of the reasons for looking at this is that it is kind of lost in a lot of um, science programs in high school and middle school, and I think even in universities, what these principles are, how you do them. And I think in a university, particularly when you get to grad school, it's often supposed to be the duty of the advisor um the advisor or the um, the research mentor that you're working with in college that is supposed to help you with these things, but increasingly it seems to be a bit forgotten. So this is a good place to start. Um, so Dewey here, this 1938 paper, is, he is, Dewey is actually quite a good scientist also from the old days. Throughout this report, we argue that science is a competent inquiry that produces unwarranted, uh, produces, strike that, produces warranted assertions and ultimately develops a theory supported by evidence. That's another way to say that science is about the method, really. There's a, there's a lot of importance behind the method of finding an answer to questions. That's basically what an inquiry is. You, you're looking for an answer to a question. Um, but probably one of the most important things about that and where it becomes where science really does show its creative stripes and where some of the greatest scientists are made isn't in the research that they did, but it's in how they phrased the question and the questions they were willing to ask. And so that's why the first principle is really, really important. Actually, the first two is posing significant questions that can be investigated empirically um, here. And so let's, you know, let's get into that. So, the principle here um, has two parts. The first concerns the nature of the question posed. Science proceeds by posing significant questions about the world with multiple potential answers that lead to hypotheses or conjectures that can be tested and refuted. The second part concerns how these questions are posed. They must be posed in such a way that it is possible to test the adequacy of alternative answers through carefully designed and implemented observations. Observations is a little bit more broad here, and we'll get to that in a second. But so this this is both of these parts are actually really really important, and and the question significance is is probably the single most important thing. Um, though again, empirically matters a lot too, and we'll get to that in a second. But the the notion here is you are asking a question, but you must also recognize that the question that you ask has multiple answers. Or potentially multiple answers. And the idea then is that when you've posed that question that has multiple answers, you are looking uh, then what is your high, then you can test what is your hypo 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 hypothesis bleh, um, that you can test related to that question, which is to say you're posing a question like why is the sky blue? And then looking for an answer as to, and then you pose what you think the answer is. Um, so why is the sky blue? Okay, what would I be posing the answer? Um, I would pose that the answer is that water droplets act like little prisms, and the angle of the sun as it moves through our sky with the perception and angle uh, we have, then there results um, in the refraction of light. Most of those uh, shades of light go away from you, but it is the blue light that reaches your eye, and thus the sky appears blue to our eyes. And this is something that has been tested, actually. That is a known, <laughs> that is a known uh, thing. I just stated something from meteorology that has an answer to it. If you Google why is the sky blue, you will find the answer. Um, there too. So <laughs> that doesn't count as a question you can go answer, unfortunately. So let's start with that is the first, first part of the first principle, the significance of the question you're asking. A crucial but typically undervalued aspect of successful scientific investigation is the quality of the question posed. 
Moving from hunch to conceptualization and specification of a worthwhile question is essential to scientific research. Indeed, many scientists owe their renown less to their ability to solve problems than their capacity to select insightful questions for investigation, a capacity that is both creative and disciplined. And, and this is, again, this is why having so many perspectives and why having a viewpoint diversity in science is actually really, really helpful because you can look at questions, look at problems differently and reframe the question and think of some very careful questions to ask. Um, the formulation of a problem is often more essential than its solution, which may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skill. To raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old questions from a new angle, requires creative imagination and marks real advances in science. And this is very true. Most of the greatest scientists in history, if you're reading um, from, from that, they posed very creative questions. And this is where you can let your imagination run a little bit wild. Not entirely. We'll get to that in a second. Um, questions here are posed in an effort to fill a gap in existing knowledge or to seek new knowledge to pursue the identification of the cause or causes of some phenomena, to describe a phenomena, to solve a practical problem, or to formally test a hypothesis. And there's a lot of hypothesis testing that's involved in all of these. So as you do science, this first thing is really important with respect to the questions you're asking as a scientist. You are asking here things that we need to fill gaps. So, so you, you, you've you done a lot of work already when you're asking a question to say, this is what current research, current science about meteorology, about biology, about climate, about physics, about any number of different things. This is what they currently say. What's the, but from that research, you can pick out, this is the gap in the knowledge. That's when you start asking a question. You ask a question that fills the gap in the knowledge. And there's a lot of different ways that that can come up. You can also be asking something that's completely new. And you might observe something in the re something when you're looking at physics or chemistry research or any number of the different science disciplines of research. You might observe that they didn't ask a question about something um, for whatever reason, it could have been because they didn't have the technology and it couldn't observe it. They didn't have, um, didn't have people who were pointing out to them that this thing happens. Cause that does come too. actually, there is a benefit to local and just general public knowledge pointing out to a scientist, Hey, this weird thing is happening over here and we don't know why. And you may, sometimes a scientist will have an explanation for it right off the top and other times they won't. And that's where it poses a very significant research question. Um, and so, yeah, there's that. In fact, matter, pursue the identification of cause or causes of some phenomena. This is actually a lot of times where current sort of things going on um, in the world, um, like why did a particular area flood in a storm when it didn't before, or, or, you know, what's the vulnerabilities of things like that. This is where societal needs often intersect with science is there's some kind of a problem <laughs> solving a practical problem or some phenomena that we don't know why it's happening, um, but it has some kind of importance. You want to describe that phenomena as a scientist is one thing. Solving practical problems is one of the biggest ways where interests of society overlaps with science quite a lot and provides a lot of questions um, that scientists can pose and, and attempt to answer in their process. A good question may reframe an older problem in the light of newly available tools or techniques, methodological or theoretical. For example, the political science Robert Putnam challenged the accepted wisdom that increased modernity led to decreased civic involvement, and his work has been challenged in turn. A question may also be retesting a hypothesis under new conditions or circumstances. Indeed, studies that replicate earlier work are key to robust research findings that hold across settings and objectives of inquiry. See, principle five, we'll get there. A good question can lead to a strong test of a theory, however explicit or implicit the theory may be. So this has to do with, we're always building in knowledge and what have you, and you always, this leads to another principle, which is the replication part of it. Um, you're always testing things over and over and over and over again. You never reach a sort of generalized model of how something works. 
until it's tested and tested and retested and retested and repeatedly retested over and over and over again in a very in very many different circumstances. So for example, one thing that I would do is I study climate modeling in Puerto Rico, where I studied that um, as part of my PhD and how climate models behaved in Puerto Rico and what was the best um, best way to set up this climate model and run it over Puerto Rico for the things that I was interested in, which was rated, related to tropical precipitation and what have you, and precipitation in island areas to begin with, which, which are notoriously difficult to model. Um, and so I set that condition differently, and I actually found that something in Puerto Rico didn't work um, like previous research in Hawaii had shown it would work which was actually very similar. Hawaii is actually a very similar kind of problem to Puerto Rico. Um, and so that was complementing research. My question was very valid because it was a very different circumstance in that Puerto Rico is a very different part of the planet. It's a little closer to the equator than Hawaii is, also gets a significant amount of precipitation the same way Hawaii does, and it's an island in the middle of the ocean. Um, so lots of things there that we could test for, different circumstances that were involved in new conditions. That's a way to test a question. Um, a prime example of this is with falsifiability is many people look at the notion of, uh, like water boils at 100 degrees, for instance. Well, okay, how did we come to that? Water boils at 100 degrees, but then that was tested and retested and retested. And then when you take a pot of boiling water to Denver, mile high above sea level, no, it actually boils at something a little bit off from 100 degrees. <laughs> and so from that, they determine, oh, okay, the boiling temperature of water has a relationship with the pressure of the atmosphere that's involved there. And um, because of that, we say now the proper language there is that water will boil at 100 degrees um, Celsius at sea level. <laughs> or close to sea level. Anyway, um, so things like that, you keep testing those hypotheses over and over and over and over again with different, um, different situations. That is a totally appropriate, significant question to ask. Uh, the significance of a question can be established with reference to prior research and relevant theory, as well as relationship to important claims pertaining to policy or practice. In this way, scientific knowledge grows as new work is added to and integrated with the body of material that has come before. This body of knowledge includes theories, models, research methods, uh, designs and measurements, research tools, microscopes, questionnaires, surveys. Um, indeed, science is not only an effort to produce representations of real-world phenomena by going from nature to abstract signs, Embedded in their practice, scientists also engage in the development of objects, instruments, or practices. The scientific knowledge is a byproduct of both technological and analytic activities. So, what this is to say is that we use a lot of technology um, as we do scientific questions, and a lot of those questions grow and change as our technological capacity has increased, we can observe new things, we can model new things, we can do all this stuff that we couldn't think about doing a hundred years ago. Um, a prime example of this and in, in the advancement of science is after the um, after World War II, you had the first computers get really used in circulation in the US and that prompted all sorts of things to happen you had all sorts of things to happen. If you think about what was 70 years ago with computers at that time and what was being used in military purposes and the advancement of technology for national security at the time, now the ability of computing and computers to be able to calculate things that were impossible for us to calculate by hand has led to some tremendous advancements in multiple different scientific disciplines, whether it be whether it be the entire field of climate modeling, which owes its existence in large part now to being able to work on computers, um, to economic kind of modeling activities, to being able to represent um, uh, river systems and the water flow that results from a flooding rain event, for instance. All of those things are possible with computers now. Um, in fact, no matter all the things that you have on your phone are possible because of 70 years ago, somebody thought to figure out how to make a computer <laughs> work. It all started from there. Um, 70 years ago in World War II era is when they started seriously with computers. Anyway, um, so things like that. Technology and science go hand in hand. And those kinds of things 
really do uh, relate to whatever kind of question you might want to ask. Um, you don't want to just ask a random question that's insignificant that somebody else has already asked. You got to look at the research too. That's the other thing about a significant question. If you're if you're doing that, and there's there's a kind of thing there. There's a lot of different types of questions actually that one can ask, um, and it go and it breaks down to the idea of basic versus applied research or basic versus use inspired research. Is what kind of scientific research are you doing? Um, so. Stokes, in 1997, he did provide a really useful framework for thinking about those kinds of important questions that can advance knowledge and method both. Um, so a lot of what I do research-wise in, in hindsight in, in this is actually about method because I do a lot of research on climate models <laughs> and how we represent the world and how accurate they are and what improvements need to be made. So there's a lot of method questions that I end up asking um, alongside of, you know, just general, how does the climate work? Um... Let's see. So he Stokes created something called Pasteur's Quadrant, which was the conception of research questions. And there's a graphic down here we'll see in a second. But the basic idea with it is there's a few different types of questions um, that are involved. Yeah, um, here. This is actually the quadrant, quadrant model of scientific research. And this is all about the types of questions. Um, there's pure basic research, there's use inspired basic research, there's pure research, pure applied research, and this is more in your Thomas Edison kind of frame. Um, the, quest the question that you're asking is, are you seeking fundamental understanding or not first um, here? And that's asking yourself um, with the questions. This, is this a fundamental understanding that you're seeking? Which is to say, are you trying to understand the fundamentals of physics and improve upon that? Are you trying to understand and do more work with, let's say, how a thunderstorm forms and why does it form there? Um, that, and you're not considering, that that's the kind of questions you ask on the fundamental understanding kind of thing with your own research question. Is this research question that you're after about fundamentals? understanding fundamental understanding of phenomena of of things that ha of things that are happening in the natural world or or with the human world too this is uh this is applicable to social sciences too um and the other question that you ask is what is the use consideration in here and this is this is where public uh, this is where um society and policy kind of things come creeping back and making their connections in science in that you do have considerations of use um, if you're just interested in doing fundamentals, but you don't care how it's used or what does it matter, um, kind of thing, uh, what kind of, what kind of impact it may have or what kind of uses may be involved for the information that you, for the answers that you acquire, um, to your question, um, then you're doing just pure basic research. And there's a lot of great scientists that do that, um, here. There's a lot of great scientists that do that. On the other hand, is if you are after doing um, doing research that can be used by others or used outside of your own discipline, or or is immediately connected to some kind of problem that's going on in the real in the world right now, um, say like a flooding river, for instance, you want to understand why this river floods so that you're helping the communities around that river adapt and cope. That's a research question that is use inspired um, here, and it may it has some fundamental understanding to it, or it could, um, particularly if that river, let's say in this example, is not very researched at all. Um, then yeah, you want to understand. Okay, wait a second. How, how, what kind of flows or precipitation amounts, or what's the runoff going on here, or things like that, and that may be an evolving kind of thing of quest for fundamental understanding because. Um, of course, people put buildings and things and there's developments going around and that affects the flows of rivers. So there's a little interaction, but um, there's that use inspired thing also. So if you're doing, if you're asking a question um, that's related to a problem um, or related to something going on in the real world or, or some kind of phenomena that's having an impact in the real world that needs immediate things, uh, like Actually, COVID-19 in recent life, uh, in recent history is a good example of use-inspired kind of research is that we were really working fast. The doctors and um, geneticists and peer, um, epidemiologists and what have you were working as fast as they could to understand that particular virus at a fundamental level because it was new. Um, and so we could 
have used this port to figure out how to tell people to best avoid it. You know, who was going to be impact impacted by it and who we needed to care for the most. That's a good example of use inspired basic research. And also the other kind of thing is that when it's not fundamental understanding anymore, and you already know a lot of basics, but you're then assessing your question is about how that fundamental thing affects um, something else or affects society or affects um Say, like, for me, I often look at, I know how climate is going to change, but I'm also then doing research on how that, what does that mean for hydrology? That's an applied research kind of aspect where you're not as concerned about the fundamental understanding of a phenomena. I'm not as concerned in some of the work that I do about the fundamentals of climate and how the climate is going to change, because there is a lot of that already. No, I'm more concerned about what does that mean for X, that's an applied research kind of question. They're all very good questions. And it's just a little bit on that kind of context where he talked about here, um, where they talked about it here. Questions are posed to fill a gap in existing knowledge duh, 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 here where you're, you know, looking to pursue the identification of the cause of some phenomena to describe a phenomena, fill a gift, gap in knowledge. Um, so like this part up here, is a bit more basic and it goes to the end here when you get into practical problems that's where you get to the more applied kind of side of questions a lot of the time um interestingly in universities there's a healthy tug of war <laughs> between what's more important basic research or applied research um here so sometimes it can get um, interesting when you're talking about it in the university one thing in all of this to remember is that you are asking a question that has multiple answers here um, you are not asking a question, um, and then deliberately seeking information that supports how you think the answer to the question should be. It does, if that makes sense. You are asking a question, you are doing research to see if what you think is the right answer to that question, but if you think your hypothesis is correct. You are not doing research on your hypothesis to confirm that it's the answer to your question. And there's a difference there because that's the confirmation bias kind of thing. And you always have to be open as a scientist with the question to the possibility that your answer and your hypothesis for why this happens is wrong. Um, there are other, other disciplines and things like that. That's it's pseudoscience. When you go in, this is the absolute thing. I know it's right. And you're absolutely seeking for evidence to confirm what you believe to be true about the question. That is not what science does. That's not correct with respect to the guiding principles of this, nor the normative principles of science as a discipline as a whole. You are looking specifically, you, you, are, you are doing research to say, okay, I think it might be this, but I'm not sure. You're not going in saying, I know it's this, I'm going to find evidence of it. There, do, it's hard to get at carefully in this kind of video, but do you see what I mean in that it's confirmation bias. You are trying to confirm that this is what it really is because I believe it so strongly that this is what the answer is. No, 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 no. That's not what you're supposed to do. If you, if you have a hypothesis and your analysis says that your hypothesis is incorrect, that's what you got to write up in the paper, to be honest. You don't go confirming and redoing experiments left and right until you get the answer that you want. You get the answer that it is, and that's it. And speaking of which, the other part that's really important with the first principle is putting it simply um, here. Empirical refers to observation. So any question that you ask, you have to ask it in such a way that you can get at it empirically. And generally speaking, empirically refers to observation, that you can see it, that you have some way of measuring it, um, that you have some analysis that you can do that supports your work. Uh, that supports the answer, supports whatever the answer might be to your question. So you, science often, like, we're, we're concerned about making sense of the world itself. Physical processes, of course, human interactions involved in that now too. Um, it has to be grounded in observations of the world itself, of reality, which is to say you can't make a moralizing question in science. That's not the job of a scientist. You're asking a question about the world as it is um, here and trying to get an answer about the world as it is. <laughs> so they've got some examples here that I think will elucidate this here nicely. So 
Since science is concerned with making sense of the world, the wor its work is necessarily grounded in observations that can be made about it, which is the world. Thus, research questions must be posed in ways that potentially allow for empirical investigation. For example, both Milenkovic and Muller could collect data on the Earth's orbit to explain the periodicity of ice age in ice ages. Likewise, Putnam could collect data from natural variations in regional government to address the question of whether modernization leads to a demise of civic community. And the Tennessee State Legislature could empirically assess whether reducing class sizes improved students' achievement in early grades, because achievement data could be collected on students of varying class sizes. In, quest in contrast, questions such as, should all students be required to say the Pledge of Allegiance, cannot be submitted to empirical investigation and thus cannot be examined scientifically. Answers to these questions lie in realms other than science. So that's, this is a really important thing. Science is based upon data, upon evidence. You, we're not asking moralizing questions, and this goes back to other things I have said many times on this channel. Science will never, ever, ever provide you a moral compass. It never does. It can't ever do that because that's not what science does itself. It is a method by which to answer questions, and specifically about questions about the world itself around us. It is not about moralizing questions about life. It cannot do that. Uh, it cannot do that. It should not do that. Scientists should not be involved in doing that, at least as part of their professional thing. There's the difference between the citizen and the scientist. We can get into that another time. But that's the important thing, is any question that you make when you're starting to do scientific research or scientific inquiry, it has to be a significant question that you're filling a gap or answering a problem or any number of different things um, there. But it also has to be a question you can answer with data, with evidence, with some kind of observation of the world. Um, and at times this does include modeling too, like the climate models that I use, because we can justify that in the sense of if the model does well performing in the historical kind of period, then we can make a, a, an assessment about what does it possibly mean for the future. Couching it with a little bit of statistics, but yes, um, we can do that. That does count uh, here. But that's that's the thing, is if it's a question that I can't answer with data, like should all students be required to say the Pledge of Allegiance is a moral question um, here. And you can't answer that with data. That's a moral question for somebody for folks to duke it out in philosophy or science or what have you. Any kind of those moral questions? Nope. That's not your job as a scientist. That is not the job of scientific inquiry. That is not a, not a good question here. So that's it for the first principle. Um, I'll go on to the other ones in other separate videos here, but the first principle of scientific inquiry, of course, is to ask significant questions that are based, that can be investigated empirically with data. So that's it. Um, let me know if you have questions. Uh, that's a very short primer on it. Of course, uh, this, this book is actually great to read if you want a little bit in here on some of the more deep depth and detail on each of these and uh, amongst other things. Uh, if you like this video, subscribe to the channel. I look forward to seeing your comments and all that kind of jazz in here. I will be doing more of some of the other things because I've got another video I may record later um, that is going to have me rant a little bit <laughs> on a few things that have aggravated the heck out of me lately. Anyway, uh, that's it for now. Until next time, I'm Adrian signing off. Stay curious, my friends.